Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. We'll give folks just a couple of seconds here to get logged in, and we will begin shortly. Again, if you're just joining us, we'll give folks a couple of seconds here to get logged in, and we will begin the webinar shortly. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Once again, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Vendor Pre-Solicitation Conference. This is DIR's uh, IT Research and Advisory Subscription Services and Computer Assisted Legal and Investigative Research Services. Request for offer number DIR CPO TMP 573. Glad to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, before we get started, we want to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. So if we go to the next slide, just a couple of reminders, you can switch between your audio and computer uh, if you have any trouble. So you do have that flexibility. We want to remind everybody that today's attendees are muted. Uh, but before we get started, if you would just quickly raise your hand and let us know that you can hear us pretty clearly today. We just want to make sure we've got a good connection with everybody. Awesome. Thank you. See lots of hands going up. So please open the Q&A box in your meeting controls and put all of your questions in that Q&A box. Uh, please don't use the chat. Sometimes questions can get lost in there. So just a reminder, open the Q&A box and enter your questions in there. We will make the presentation available to attendees and registrants after the uh, pre-bid uh, is over today. That will be posted in an addendum along with a recording with the YouTube link uh, that you will be able to listen to as well. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, your speakers today, my name is Tom Hay. I am part of the outreach and training team here at DIR. Uh, you will hear from Marie Cohan. She is the statewide digital accessibility program manager and will discuss accessibility requirements today as they pertain to the RFO. Kyle Gabbett is with us. Kyle is a hub coordinator here at DIR, and he will cover the uh, hub portion of the RFO today, as well as Stephanie Harrison. She is the director of our statewide cooperative procurement department here at DIR. She is also the procurement lead for this request for offer, and you will hear a lot from her this afternoon as well. Okay, our agenda today, we're going to cover the RFO view, RFO overview. We will cover the the RFO contents and scope. We will walk through the evaluation criteria. Uh, we will cover the terms of the contracts as well as the schedule, uh, the hub requirements that are part of this RFO. We will cover the pricing sheet and the accessibility or EIR uh, requirements as they pertain to this RFO. We will also give you some general information for vendors who will be responding to us. We will cover the bid stamp vendor information system portal. Uh, we'll cover the mandatory submissions that you need to be aware of. Then we will take a little break, give you a little time to think through some questions if you may want to ask those. We will cover those questions and then we will close the conference after we finish all of that. So given that, why don't we go ahead and get started and to kick us off, I will turn it over to Stephanie Harrison. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Stephanie Harrison, and I will be the procurement lead for this solicitation. Um, so the overview for this particular RFO, it's a combination of two previous RFOs, which were um, IT Research Advisory Subscription Services under DIRTSO TMP 414, as well as the Computer Assisted Legal and Investigative Research Services, or the CalAIR which was DIR TSO TMP 261. We've combined those two into our RFO that um, um, this pre-bid pertains to, which is the new one, DIR CPO TMP 573. DIR may make multiple awards from this RFO in order to establish the master contracts that our customers utilize. Next slide, please. Some historical sales for DIR. Um, we have a customer base that varies from state agencies, 
K through 12, local government, out of state entities and higher ed and assistance organizations. As you can see here on this slide, we have a breakdown of the fiscal year sales for each of those types of uh, customer bases from 2019, fiscal year 2019 through 2022. The specific sales that are broken out for the current and expiring um, solicitations for IT research, advisory subscription services, sales volume by DIR fiscal year are also below for the years fiscal year 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, those are in million, so it's about 12 million for 2020, about um, 13 million for 2021, and about 16 million for fiscal year 2022. And then for CalAir services, we had about 5 million in sales for 2020, um, about a little over 5.5 million for 2021, and um, 6 million for 2022. Next slide, please. We're going to go through the RFO. I won't go into every um, detail in the bid package, but we will do some high level points and um, bring to your attention things that you need to um, be aware of as you're preparing your response to our solicitation. So it would make it easier if you have a copy of the RFO in front of you so you can make notes and jot down questions as we go along. Please be sure to read the RFO in detail because sections may have changed from the way this was procured previously. Um, so don't assume you can use your, your previous response and still have a successful bid. Um, and then we are also going to go through the bid stamp portal system so you can learn how to submit your bid response, response to this proposal. We will cover the um, RFO, which contains attachments one through three and exhibits A through K. So attachment one is going to be the sample contract. Um, attachment two is the sample terms and conditions. Attachment three is a sample service agreement. Your response documents are going to be the exhibits A through K, which will be your respondent information, your exhibit B, respondent history and experience, exhibit C, which is the contract marketing and support plan, exhibit D, your hub subcontracting plan, exhibit E, which is your itemized pricing, exhibit F, or reference forms. Next slide, please. Exhibit G, which is the respondent release of liability form. Your exhibit H, which is the Edgar certification form. Your exhibit A, J, and K are all your accessibility documentation. Next slide. Okay, next slide. And we will start off with the request for offer. Um, in the term of the contract, we anticipate Anticipate these contracts being five year. So it would be an initial two year term with one optional two year renewal and one optional one year renewal. The renewals are automatically renewed at the end of each um, expiration, assuming that your contract is in good standing to continue with DIR. Um, and that renewal option will uh, automatically kick in unless there's some issue that your contract manager should be addressing with you um, at that point. Next slide, please. This is our anticipated schedule of events. This RFO was posted on February 16th. Today's March 3rd, we're at the pre-proposal webinar. March 6th is the deadline for submitting the questions and I'll discuss how you will submit those to me um, at 5 p.m. Central Time. March 30th is the deadline for DIR to receive the vendor references as well as the deadline for submitting the responses to the RFO. That deadline is March 30th at 2 p.m. Central Time. And then we'll go into the evaluations and um, negotiations once we receive all responses. Please note that all times are in Central Standard Time. Next slide, please. In section 4.2.1, the RFO goes over the evaluation of responses. Please be sure that you read through the entire RFO so you understand um, what it is we're looking for and what it is that you're required to submit. It's covered in a couple of different areas throughout the RFO um, as what you have to submit. There's a checklist that's in the RFO. There's also a checklist that is in the Exhibit A um, that you need to be aware of that you have completed everything and submitted all of the documentation in order to have a responsive proposal. 
So in section 4.2.1, the first thing says incomplete response package will be rejected, which is why I was referencing that checklist. Other things that will cause your response to be rejected and not move forward into the evaluation or negotiation is the um, incompletion of the financial review, the financial information requested in Exhibit A. Um, the HUB subcontracting plan, if you do not submit a HUB subcontracting plan or you submit one that is blank, you will also fail and not move forward. So both the financial review and the HUB subcontracting plan review are on a pass-fail basis. Failure to provide the DUNS number may, respond, may result in your response being disqualified. Also be sure that the DUNS number that you supply, especially for some of the bigger agencies, actually matches the name and address of the company that you're submitting out there. Some bigger agencies may have more than one DUNS. Um, and if you're submitting and please check in with your financial people or whoever is in charge of your um, DUNS account that you're matching the correct DUNS number with the name of the vendor that you're responding under. Only responses that receive a passing grade will proceed to the next evaluation phase. Um, so passing is kind of like a scorecard or a report card. Um, you have to be able to meet all the pass-fail criteria, and then you have to, um, in order to get to the evaluation phase, and then to continue to move, you have to score high enough on the evaluation phase to continue to move and be invited to negotiations. So what are we evaluating? That's in section 4.2.2. You have pricing that you have to submit. That makes up 30% of your total score. The respondent history and experience form is your exhibit B. That is 40% of your total score, and which includes all the attachments. So please, please be, make sure you submit a complete response to that. And the respondent's contract marketing and customer support plan makes up 30%. That is your exhibit C. Whenever you're responding to an RFO, assume that the evaluator um, has no idea who your company is and you are coming in as a, um, we have no background, we have no history, we have no knowledge of your company, and you're presenting your best um, best effort in getting our that information conveyed in paper to us. Um, we generally do not have um, oral presentations or demonstrations or anything um, outside of the package that you're submitting. So for us to be able to evaluate and score all the information that we need to be able to do that must be in the documents that you submit to DIR. Next slide, please. Exhibits A, A1, and B. Um, so exhibit A is your respondent information form. This form has a lot of uh, uh, just straightforward information. It is not scored. However, you are completely disqualified if you do not submit it and have, this is very important, a um, it must be signed by an officer or an agent empowered to contractually bind the respondent. There's several certifications that are a part of that form that that signature attests that your company is in agreement to and can comply with and is willing to comply with all of those certifications. Um, so the individual that signs off on that form must have the authority to do so on behalf of your company. No signature on that form disqualifies your entire response. So if you're using electronic signatures, which are accepted, make sure it's an actual electronic signature and not a typed in somebody's name on that form. That will not be accepted. Actual electronic signatures that go through a signature verification process like um, Adobe Sign or DocuSign or something of that nature, we can accept. If you do not have those tools, you will need to actually print and sign the signature page form and load that as part of your response. Your exhibit A1 exceptions. We do allow exceptions to the DIR standard terms and conditions and or the contract language. However, um, I will go into a little bit more detail on our exceptions and um, what we don't wanna see on that exception. But if you are submitting the exceptions, we have the format that is detailed in the exhibit A, and there's an A1 exceptions table that you will need to complete and fill out for those to even be considered. Exhibit B is the respondent history and experience. This is scored and evaluated and counts up to um, uh, the percentage on your contract. 
or potential, I'm sorry, on your evaluation. You must provide the detailed response to each question in the respondent's history and experience. Um, please don't add links or references to other sections. Make sure you fill this out completely. If you're proposing IT research and advisory services, there is an Exhibit B that is specifically for that. Complete that one. If you're responding to uh, CalAir services, complete that Exhibit B. If you are actually proposing both, um, please complete both Exhibit Bs that are a part of the package. Next slide, please. Your Exhibit C, D, and E. Your C is your contract marketing and customer support plan. This is also scored. There are specific questions in the Exhibit C that walk you through what we expect to see on your contracting, contract marketing and support plan. Please be sure that you address each of the questions in your response. Um, failure to do so may result in a much lower score on this section than you anticipated. If there are attachments, please include the attachment as um, requested. Um, and please adhere to the page counts that we have in the Exhibit C. Ex exhibit D, the historically underutilized business plan, um, will be discussed in greater detail. That's your hub plan. You must have a signed version of the hub plan. The example that we have in the packet is just an example. Kyle will go over where you need to go to download the actual form and complete that, and he'll go over in detail on what needs to go into that form. Your Exhibit E is your price list. You must submit specific pricing for products and services um, that you're proposing. That goes into your Exhibit E. This is a service-heavy um, RFO. So there are instructions on how to complete the automated portion, which are going to be um, very minimal for you all. And then the majority of your um, offerings are going to be on the Exhibit E itemized price sheet, which also has its own list of instructions. Next slide, please. Your Exhibit F is your vendor references. Your Exhibit G is the respondent release of liability for the references. So you have to submit, um, you submit the Exhibit G, your references are going to submit the Exhibit F. And your Exhibit H is the Edgar certification form that you must <clears throat> fill out and complete and submit as a part of the federal requirements for this RFO. Important to note on the vendor references is that the respondent may not submit the form directly to DIR. These need to come to DIR from your customer reference. There are instructions in the RFO, and then there's a particular um, email address that your reference needs to submit that form to. Next slide, please. Exhibits I, J, and K are going to be gone over in detail. These are your accessibility forms. And I will let Marie talk about those here in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk briefly about the scope. The scope is covered in Section 2 of the RFO. DIR intends to contract with the successful respondents to provide IT research and advisory subscription services and computer-assisted legal and investigative research services. You may submit for one, either one, or both. If you're submitting to both, again, you must clearly distinguish between the service categories in your pricing, and you must submit both um, Exhibit B options. Next slide, please. The computer-assisted legal and investigative research services include things like online legal reference materials, general public record databases and materials, restricted access public record databases and materials for law enforcement, new services and news databases, other similar products offered by the respondent, um, and then the related services for CalAir tend to be documentation and training and support. Support includes things like online support, research assistance, software additions, updates, enhancements, and others. Please refer to the RFO for additional details on that area. Next slide, please. For IT research and advisory subscription services, areas of interest may include, but are not limited to, reliable and secure services, mature IT resource management, IT security, cost-effective and collaborative solutions, data utility, mobile and digital services. Next slide. 
Examples of research include, but are not limited to, general research, business and finance, health, education, science, library materials, state-specific, IT, local government, state and public interest, and then miscellaneous. Next slide. Exclusions are out of scope. Um, related services only are out of scope. So if you're only providing installation, maintenance, support, training, without also providing an associated IT research and advisor subscription or Keller services, those will not be awarded. Um, custom application development services are out of scope. DBITs, which are our deliverable-based IT services, are out of scope because we have a completely different DBITs RFO. Cloud broker services, cloud assessment services, and then professional or consulting services as defined by Chapter 2254 of the Texas Government Code. DIR also has a list of prohibited items that are posted on the DIR website. Many of these are banned um, technologies at a federal or state level, and DIR will not um, award any of those offerings on DIR contracts. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle, and he will discuss with you the hub subcontracting plan requirements. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Kyle Gavitt, um, and I'm going to go over the hub subcontracting plan with you. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about where you can locate this. So you can find the hub subcontracting plan at the link provided on the comptroller's website. It will have the most up-to-date forms. Uh, the vendor will complete the form that is on the comptroller's website. You will print it, sign it, and then upload the signed HSP into the VIS portal. Uh, and then if we could go to the next slide. Uh, so all respondents are required to submit an HSP. Failure to submit a completed HSP will cause your response to be rejected. And as was mentioned earlier, this is a pass or fail item. Uh, there are three ways to complete the HSP. You will either self-perform, you will meet or exceed the hub goal and complete the method A, or if you do not meet the hub goal, you will complete the method B. Uh, and as it's, oh, I'm sorry, if we could just go back for one second. As it says on the slide that uh, responses submitted without a current HSP provided in the RFO will be disqualified uh, per TAC rule 20.285. Um, again, all respondents, including hubs and non-hubs, are required to submit a completed HSP. Um, and then the HSP form includes specific instructions for meeting the good faith effort requirements. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Sorry about that. Um, and so the hub goal for this RFO is 21.1%. Uh, so a method A, uh, if you are subcontracting uh, and you are meeting or exceeding the hub goal for this RFO, you would complete the method A. Uh, you'll want to be sure to include all vendor IDs for each vendor, uh, as well as an estimated dollar amount and percentage for each vendor. Uh, so to complete the method A, you would want to do sections one, two, four, and then the method A section. Um, and then if we could go to the next slide. Um, so the method B, uh, so if you are subcontracting and you're not going to meet the hub goal of 21.1%, you will complete method B. So you'll want to provide written notification of the subcontracting opportunity listed to at least three state of Texas certified hubs. You'll also provide written notification of the subcontracting opportunity to at least two minority or women trade organizations or development centers. Um, please be sure to allow no less than seven working days from their receipt of notice for the hub responses. Um, and then keep the delivery receipt emails. Note that, e uh, that attaching supporting documentation, uh, whether it's a letter, email, et cetera, uh, demonstrating the evidence of your good faith effort. And for method B, you'll want to complete sections one, two, and four, as well as the method B attachment. And again, remember to include the approximate dollar amount and percentages for each vendor. Um, and then if you are not subcontracting, your response must contain a detailed explanation uh, demonstrating how your company will fulfill the entire contract with its own resources. Uh, Self-performing justification must be provided in the space provided in section three. Um, and just a reminder, please don't make any changes or edit the HSP document. 
And again, for this, for the self-performing, uh, you will want to use sections one, two, three, and four. Um, and then if you have any uh, questions you, uh, regarding your HSP, you may contact DIR's hub department for assistance in completing your HSP. Uh, please allow up to seven working days before the RFO submittal is due. Uh, and again, uh, you can reach out to the DIR hub email box, or you can reach out to Teresa Williamson. She is the hub program manager. Um, and I think now we're going to turn it back over to Stephanie. Okay, thank you. We're going to go over the exhibit E price sheet. Next slide, please. So the bid stamp portal requires that we have um, an entry into the bid stamp portal for it to um, recognize your submission for pricing. Because these are services pricing, I, we want everything on the Excel spreadsheet that is attached but you will create one entry in the bid stamp portal. So it recognizes that you submitted that portion for a complete portion. So what you're going to do is to um, submit in the automated pricing form, the required fields for one entry, and then it will go through um, and you can enter it just like it says here, there's test and then a discount off of it. And it'll show that you submitted the pricing in bid stamp. Um, and then everything else should go on your Excel spreadsheet. Next slide, please. So for the itemized pricing, we have um, five tabs. You have the instructions. You have services and related services for research advisory subscription services. There's a tab for um, related services discount sheet. There's a tab for Calair pricing. And then there's a tab for complete catalog. All the instructions are in that tab one. Um, it's pretty straightforward on what you need to input and to um, include in there. However, please take the time to go through that. And if you have questions, please submit them prior to the um, question and answer period um, before that closes so we can address those in the Q in the addendum Q&A document. You want to enter the prices for each item that your company would like to offer um, in the applicable tabs. And then for certain products that have like, maybe you may have an interface, you might have additional documentation that would be included with that proposal. Um, so for the elements for the price sheet, we're gonna have the service category, the service description, the MSRP or the list price, the discount being offered and the DIR customer price. And those should um, uh, calculate across, um, I may have to update the spreadsheet because I noticed that one of the formulas was missing in that one. So that would come out in the um, in the addendum. Um, but the calculations will show the DIR final customer price. Um, and that price will actually include the administrative fee in the total pricing. Next slide, please. We're going to go through attachments one, two, and three. Um, just a high level overview. I'm not going to go through all of them because they are the attachments in the ESBD posting. Please read through them and make sure you understand them. Your attachment one is your sample contract. Your attachment two is the current um, standard terms and conditions. We don't anticipate those changing prior to the closing of this RFO. Um, they may change towards the end of the year after this legislative session, but we anticipate those being this, the same standard terms and conditions um, throughout the evaluation process. And then attachment three is a sample service agreement template. If that is applicable, that will be an attachment that is added to your contract. It is a template for customers and vendors to use. So on a service agreement a template, you, there's really not anything that... Um, you all have to do it other than be aware that that's our template that we use. Um, please review the sample contract and the uh, DIR terms and conditions to make sure that you understand and that you agree to them. I discussed earlier that you are allowed to take exceptions to the contract. That is not um, exceptions that are excessive, may cause your response to be non-responsive. Exceptions that are just changing verbiage um, maybe cause your response to be non-responsive. Exceptions to areas that are mandatory. So statutorily required exceptions are not allowed. 
um, and exceptions that weaken the contract terms and conditions are also not allowed or that conflict. So the one of the purposes of the DIR co cooperative contract is um, to have standard terms and conditions across multiple contracts. So DIR puts in place the minimum standard terms and conditions that our um, customers are used to seeing. Um, when we start deviating away from the standard terms and conditions, it takes value away from having master level contracts. DIR at any given point in time has between eight and 900 cooperative contracts, and there is just not the um, value in having eight to 900 different sets of terms and conditions. So use that um, option to take exceptions um, very only when it's absolutely necessary, like you cannot do business without having that exception to that term and condition. And then please note that DIR may not agree to that exception and they may not approve it. Um, so that actually may cause you not to get a contract in the, um, in the long run. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn this over to Marie, who's going to discuss with you about the accessibility documentation. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hello, my name is Marie Cohan. I'm the Statewide Digital Accessibility Program Administrator, and I'm going to go through the accessibility requirements for this solicitation, and I'll be covering um, the exhibits uh, related to the VPAT, the VABSER, and the PDAA. You will hear me mention EIR throughout this presentation, and that stands for Electronic and Information Resources. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background on um, accessibility and procurement. In Texas has a statute, uh, 2054, that requires um, all technology to be accessible for state agencies and the public. Um, DIR has created rules in TAC 206 for websites and TAC 213 for electronic and information resources. Um, and we also follow the World Wide Web Consortium WCAG guidelines 2.0 AA. All vendors must um, support these accessibility requirements because our customers are responsible for complying with these um, rules and industry standards. And so in your solicitation response, there will be um, required documentation to demonstrate your accessibility credibility. Next slide, please. The required documentation in your response will be an accessibility conformance report. This will be a completed VPAT for every product listed in the pricing sheet. A vendor accessibility development services information request is required for any type of development services. And a policy-driven adoption for accessibility is a self-assessment on the provided spreadsheet that demonstrates where your organization is on its accessibility maturity journey. The policy-driven adoption for accessibility is required for all IT responses or solicitation responses. Um, it could result in disqualification if it's not provided or complete. Um, and this has no tie to your product or service offering. This is specific to your organization and your accessibility maturity. Next slide, please. So moving on with the um, policy driven for adoption for accessibility, this is a spreadsheet that we provide in the packet. Um, you can complete the provided spreadsheet. It will give a score at the end. Um, it goes through questions of how your organization uh, manages accessibility training throughout the organization. Do you have accessibility uh, personnel or subject matter experts? Um, do you incorporate accessibility into your HR practices, your IT practices? Um, if you're a developer, what does your development life cycle look like with regard to accessibility? These are some of the questions that you'll see on this assessment. Again, this is just an assessment to help us understand and help our customers understand um, where your knowledge is and maturity with regard to accessibility. It is not associated with any product or service offering in your response. This is specific to your organization, and it is a required document. Next slide, please. The Voluntary Product Accessibility Template is an industry standard template. Uh, it is in your packet, and it goes through the different performance criteria for products um, and the success criteria that they need to test against that is defined by WCAG. 
The state of Texas baseline um, level is WCAG 2.0 AA. So your product will be scored against that particular guideline. And in the VPAT, you'll complete or someone associated with the product and knowledgeable of how it tested against success criteria will complete in there how it performed. Did it fully support success criteria? Did it not support success criteria, et cetera? This um, completed VPAT is known as an accessibility conformance report. And the accessibility conformance report is what you will submit with your response for each product. For example, if a product has multiple versions, each version will have its own accessibility conformance report. Next slide, please. Vendor accessibility development services information request. This is for development services. I don't believe there are development services included in this um, RFO. However, I will mention that any uh, materials that are provided as a result of research should also be accessible. For example, any PDFs that are submitted, they need to be in an accessible format. Um, but if there were development services on there, this is an additional form that you would complete. And it just explains to us what your software development cycle looks like, what type of corrective actions you have in place, what kind of alternate means can you provide if there is a gap in compliance. Next slide, please. These are some additional resources for you that um, we have links to our website. There's a lot of resources on our website regarding procurements. Um, there's a link to the VPAT template and one will be included in your packet. There's a link to the VABSER template. I believe that is also included in the packet and the PDAA template as well. And you are able to complete the template that is provided in the packet. Next slide, please. DIR is now providing training for our vendors. We have uh, four accessibility training classes that we offer free of charge to vendors. If you were interested in taking these classes, please contact me at statewideaccessibility at dir.texas.gov and I can send you a registration link. Next slide, please. This is my contact information. I can be reached at marie.cohan at dir.texas.gov. If you have any accessibility questions or want to reach out to me, please also um, include your contract manager for this particular solicitation. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it back over to, I believe, Tom. Okay, thank you very much, Marie. So my name is Tom Hay. I am part of the outreach and training team and a contract administration manager here at DIR. I'm going to cover some general information as it pertains to this RFO, as well as walk you through how to submit your bids for uh, re submitting responses to this RFO. So a couple of things to remember is to be sure to reference the RFO page number and section number when you are submitting questions to DIR. Uh, today's webinar participants, you can submit questions electronically at any time during the webinar today. Just put them in the, in the Q&A box. Remember that all questions answered today are unofficial until they are posted on the ESBD in the form of an addendum. So be sure to check the ESBD postings often for any updates. And a reminder, all questions regarding this RFO must be submitted in writing through the vendor uh, bid stamp, through the bid stamp vendor information system portal by March 6th, 2023 at 5 p.m. Central Time. Okay, next slide. So a couple of things to remember, we've covered these previously, but we just wanna give everybody some uh, just uh, reminders. There are disqualifications of your offers and some of those include failure to sign the responded information form, which is your exhibit A, be sure that is signed. Uh, failure to complete the financial information and the DUNS number, be sure that that is all completed when you submit. Remember, failure to complete a hub form or a hub subcontracting plan is also grounds for disqualification. Uh, failure to complete and submit the Exhibit E, which is your itemized pricing sheet. Also, failure to submit on or before the due date and time. So be sure that you are submitting your responses before the due date and time. And also a reminder that any contact with DIR employees regarding this RFO other than the designated contacts is also grounds for disqualification. And also a reminder that any vendor responding to this RFO must submit the response through the vendor and the bid stamp vendor information system. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, respondents and all respondent representatives shall not attempt to discuss the contents of this RFO with any employees or representatives of DIR other than the designated contacts. Uh, failure to observe this restriction may result in disqualification of any related response. Okay, next slide. If you have information or, or questions uh, regarding this RFO, you can reach directly out to Stephanie Harrison, whom you've heard from today. Her email address is provided. Uh, for any information uh, or to questions relating to the topics of the bid stamp portal, you can also contact Stephanie. And for any hub subcontracting plan questions, you can contact Teresa Williamson or you can email our hub box directly. Okay. So any respondent responding to this RFO must submit the response through the bid stamp vendor information system or the VIS. And before any users can, can access any of the bid stamp vendor information system portal functionality, they need to request, or, or they need to be, they will be required to provide login credentials to access a new or existing account. So vendors will access the bid stamp portal via the link that we have provided, and then you will enter uh, your access credentials there. If you do not yet have login credentials, then vendors will request one by clicking on the Are You a Vendor and Need to Request an Account button, and that is located on the login page once you get to that page. You can also view a video on uh, how to set up your bid stamp account at the link we have provided. That is a, a, a training uh, program available on how to set up bid stamp. So just a couple of notes to remember, if you have previously created a bid stamp account, you can use the same account. But if you have not previously uh, created a big stamp account, then your account information or maybe your account information has changed, maybe emails or your business name has changed, you will need to create a new account. And just another reminder that since this is not just an automatic approval process, please allow two business days for your account to be approved if you are requesting a new login. So that means you cannot wait until the day responses are due to set up your bid stamp account. You need to plan and make sure that you have received your login credentials prior to the due date of the RFO. Um, if, if you maybe you've not received your bid stamp login credentials, then please contact the, the contact listed in the RFO. Uh, the link on this slide again will take you to a video on how to set up your bid stamp account. So, uh, okay, next slide. Uh, persons with disabilities who seek accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA in responding to the solicitation may contact DIR at the point of contact in section 3.1 of the solicitation. Please allow at least five business days for a response. Okay. So when you go to uh, the homepage of dir.texas.gov, most of the information you will need is under the selling through DIR link, which is located at the, at the right side of the page. And once you click on that link, you will be taken to the next page, uh, which is where you will see the schedule of solicitation opportunities box. And then once you click in that box on the schedule of solicitation opportunities, you will be taken to this page, which is actually where the bid stamp online portal is located. And this is where you can go into the portal or you can uh, request access to bid stamp uh, through this portal as well. There is also a training guide available on this link on how to use the bid stamp uh, uh, portal. Uh, we've also provided you the direct link on this slide that will take you directly to this page as well. So once you click on the link, uh, you will be, a couple of reminders, you can have up to five users on a bid stamp account but you must use the login credentials that, that you received after you set up your bid stamp account in order to log in. And again, this is just kind of a screenshot that shows you where and how you can log in, or if you are a vendor, a new vendor, and you need to request an account, you can also click on that link uh, that is shown here on the screenshot of the bid stamp page. So once you are logged in, you will then be able to submit and manage your RFO responses from the bid stamp portal. 
uh, once you get to the screen, you will want to first click on open solicitations, which is that upper middle box, and that will allow you then to search for any open solicitations. So once you click on that open solicitations box, uh, next slide please, you will be taken to a list of uh, current solicitations that DIR currently has available for vendors to respond to. So once you log in and select the open solicitations, the one you're gonna wanna click on for this one will be listed as DIR CPO TMP 573. That will be the solicitation that you wanna respond to. Uh, so uh, you will then be, once you click on that, you'll be navigated to the RFO number detail page. And on the next slide, that's what this screen will show you. It, it displays some very important deadlines for the solicitation and list any questions that, that you, the vendor, has submitted. So you will see the actual start date. You will see the date submissions are due for questions. You will see the date that the responses are due, uh, the vendor pre-bid conference date, uh, the date that questions are due, uh, and then the date we will start evaluations. You will also notice on this screen that there are four boxes located above the uh, RFO detail that say respond to a solicitation, ask a question, subscribe to the solicitations or view solicitation documents. So uh, re remember that all times shown on this screen are a central time. So allow yourself some time for any technical issues. Again, don't wait until the last minute because once that date and time has passed, bid stamp will no longer allow you to submit your response, even if you're in the middle of submitting the response. So plan that accordingly. Um, so again, keep that in mind. If you're in process and the deadline passes, you will not be able to submit. So when you look at those four uh, gray boxes above that say respond, ask, subscribe, and view solicitation documents, uh, if you go to the next screen, we're going to go into a little more detail on what those uh, slides mean. So the first button, you can respond to a solicitation, or it might say view response. This is where you can create a new response or view a response that you've already got in process. So if a response has already been created and started, started the button will read as view response. You can then resume your progress on any existing RFO responses. Here you can also ask a question. That means you can submit a question to be reviewed by a DIR resource. And a reminder that questions can be submitted up until the question submission deadline date that is indicated in the RFO document and on the detail page. Here, you can also subscribe to solicitations, and that means that uh, you can subscribe to them if you would like to receive addendum notifications. Uh, so in order to subscribe to any solicitations, you must select the subscribe to solicitation button and have enabled your contact to receive notifications. Here you can also view solicitation documents and that will navigate you to the ESBD posting for any solicitation and you can then view the solicitation documents for that. So again, as a reminder, the ESBD is the official location for all materials for the RFO. Uh, please check the ESBD for, often for addendums to the RFO posting uh, throughout this open solicitation process. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, also on this page, once you are on the RFO and you are, uh, you are on this screen, you'll notice there's a delete button. That means you can delete all information that has been uploaded and the response record uh, before the response has even been submitted. But just a reminder that if you delete it, we cannot get it back for you. Uh, you can't call and say, oh, I accidentally deleted my response. Can I get it back? The answer is no, you'll have to start over. So keep that in mind before you hit the delete button. Um, also a couple of notes that once your response is submitted, uh, you must use the withdraw button that will appear upon the solicitation submission. So if you enter your response and you decide to withdraw, you will see the uh, withdraw button show up and you can use that withdraw button. But if you hit delete, it's gone. You'll have to start over. Uh, the submit button, that submits the response record and all associated information. So that's what you're going to hit when you're ready to submit your response to us. You can also uh, reference the vendor guide section 5.7 for additional information on submitting. Here you can also ask a question and questions can be submitted 
up until the question submission deadline as indicated in the RFO document and on the detail page. Again, you can reference the vendor guide section 5.6 for additional information on that. Here as well, you, you can also create your pricing form and that will create the pricing form to submit the pricing information for your response. Again, that's vendor guide section 5.5 for additional information. Uh, here, this is where new documents will be uh, uploaded and required uh, files as indicated in the RFO that are posted on the ESBD. So this is where your documents will lie that you will submit. That's vendor guide section 5.2. And here you can also uh, request vendor references here. You can submit new reference email addresses and then opt to send the vendor a reference or send the, re the vendor reference out. You can reference the vendor guide section 5.3 for additional information on vendor uh, references. Okay, a uh, couple of things to remember on the response contents is that respondents must provide the items listed below. Again, that's your Exhibit A, which is the respondent information, and that form must be signed. You must submit Exhibit A canceled contracts in Appendix 1 if that's applicable. Your Exhibit B must be provided. That's your respondent history and experience. Uh, your Exhibit C must be submitted. That is your contract marketing and, and support plan. Your Exhibit D is the historically underutilized uh, subcontract, help subcontracting plan. Exhibit E is the itemized price sheet. Exhibit F is vendor references. Uh, your Exhibit G uh, is your release of liability for reference. Um, a note on uh, exception, okay, Exhibit H. I'm sorry, yeah, stay right here for just a minute. Uh, so uh, no exceptions to the signature on the Exhibit A. Uh, that does have to be signed um, by, by your company in order to be considered by somebody who has the authority uh, to sign that. Uh, again, Exhibit D is the hub subcontracting plan that is required for all vendors, the itemized price sheet and references. Then your Exhibit H is the uh, Edgar certification form that is also required to be submitted. Exhibit I is the vendor accessibility uh, policy assessment or your PDAA form. Exhibit J is your VPAT form, which is the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. That's also required. Exhibit K is your VADSER form for non-commercial off-the-shelf uh, software. Also, any software licensing agreements or service agreements, if applicable. Also, any exceptions requested must be submitted as well. That's Exhibit A or an affirmative statement of the respondent takes no exceptions to the T's and C's. And also uh, the signed addenda to the RFO must, all, uh, must also be submitted. Okay, next slide. Um, a reminder, the uh, rejection of responses is that section 3.9 of the RFO states that DIR has sole discretionary authority and reserves the right to reject any and all responses received as a result of this RFO. Responses that do not comply with the mandatory submission requirements may be rejected. In addition, DIR reserves the right to accept or reject in whole or in part any responses submitted and to waive minor technicalities when in the best interest of the state. Okay, and with that, why don't we take a little bit of a break here? Uh, we'll take about 10 minutes. It is 1.53. Why don't we come back at uh, 1.54? We'll come back at, uh, let's just say 2.05. We'll just make it at 11 minutes instead of 10. And if you have questions that you want to pose today, this is your time to put those in the Q&A box. And we will take time uh, after our break to go through the questions. Uh, make sure that, that those are addressed, and then we will do the conference close after that. So we will circle back with you at 2.05.
Okay, it is 2.05, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we still have time to enter any questions into the Q&A box, so we'll go ahead and start addressing the questions. Just remember, questions answered today are unofficial until they are posted on the ESBD. You can also submit additional questions uh, through the bid stamp vendor information system. So uh, the first question is, um, in DBIT's bid, we were allowed to sign the HSP via DocuSign. However, the HSP this time asks for a wet signature. Can we uh, sign via DocuSign in lieu? Um, yes, you can sign any of the documents through DocuSign. You just want to be sure that you're using a um, software or program that actually has an electronic signature. Typed signatures or typed in names in lieu of a signature will not be accepted. Okay, one other reminder that I wanted to put for the bid stamp portion for everybody is that if you're submitting a Word document or an Excel document, make sure that you're submitting it as a Word or an Excel document. Do not transfer it over to a PDF because sometimes that truncates and we lose information. So uh, when you're when you're uploading and submitting documents through bid stamp, make sure if it's a Word document that you keep it as a Word document. Okay, next question. Uh, I wasn't aware about the bid stamp vendor system until today. If I sign up today, will I be able to ask questions still? I'm not sure if I will get access before the deadline on the 6th. Yes, you will still be able to ask questions. Okay. Okay, okay next question. Is this RFO uh, or buy to be considered as a follow-on to the existing IRT, ITRAS contract now in place? Can a supplier bid for just one component of the RFO or must the bid include both areas? Uh, why are these two different areas of subscription services being combined? Uh, is the pricing currently in place under the existing DIR contract required as pricing to be submitted under this new RFO? Um, so we opened the solicitation by saying it was combining of the IT research and advisory subscription services and CalAir services in this one RFO. However, there are two separate exhibit Bs, one for each. A respondent may reply to one or both of the um, offerings, either CalAir or the um, IT research advisory subscription services. And um, why are the two areas <clears throat> being combined? That was an executive management decision to combine that. DIR does that actually quite often where we combine multiple scopes from previous RFOs into one. And just because we re-procure it one way, one time doesn't mean that's how we're gonna do it moving forward. Um, is the pricing currently in place under the existing DIR contract required as pricing to be submitted? Now you submit your own pricing. So um, if you've updated pricing, you were a, uh, incumbent vendor and you've modified your pricing for the last time, please provide the current pricing and we'll work with that. I think I answered all those. Okay, next question. Section 2.3, DIR reserves rights to reject responses and or to waive minor technicalities. Does DIR also reserve the right to request cures of responses that do not meet DIR standards? Yes, we reserve the right to do that. Um, however, that's not a guarantee. So please ensure that you make your best effort to submit a complete and responsive response the first time around because we do not um, have a lot of time to go through and do all the one-offs um, with each vendor that submits a response. So make every best effort to uh, submit a complete response the first time. Okay, next question. Bid open date in HSP, is that the open date of the bid, the date released, or the open date when the bid will be opened by DIR? Bid open date in the HSP. Kyle, are you familiar with that in the HSP form? Um, so, yes. Oh. oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to just say, um, I believe that's supposed to be the open date for the bid. So uh, it should be the date that the bid is, I guess, the, the release date.
Can, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not familiar yeah. with that section in the HSP, so I may have to like research that and add it to our um, um, Q and A document. All of these will be in the Q and A document, but I want to clarify um, that section that you're referring to. Okay, at this time, that is all the questions that I see in the Q&A box. So if you want to go ahead, Stephanie, and wrap up. Okay, just as a quick reminder, any questions today are unofficial until posted on the Electronic State Business Daily in the form of an addendum. Please continue to uh, monitor the Electronic State Business Daily for any changes in addendums. We do not typically send out additional notifications once we um, start posting those on the ESBD. Is it up to the vendor to monitor the ESBD for any changes to the RFO, um, any new information that you may have? Um, next slide, please. Again, this is the anticipated schedule. We have um, the RFO was posted on February 16th. Today is the pre-proposal webinar, March 3rd. March 6th is the deadline at 5 p.m. is deadline for submitting questions. Now, this is a deadline for, uh, there was a question in here about if you don't get bit step access before then. We will consider questions that, um, that may need to be answered um, generally as part of the RFO after that date, but that is the, the official deadline for submitting questions, so please don't wait. The deadline for submitting the um, response to the RFO as well as for DIR to receive vendor references that will be considered as a part of your response is March 30th at 2 p.m. Central Time. After that, the um, responses will go into the evaluation process. Next slide, please. I am your single point of contact throughout this procurement unless otherwise uh, notified in an email to you all that would come from me. So all questions and inquiries um, must be directed to me, except for in those areas where you're asking, ah, sorry, specifically on Hub, which can go to the Hub department. And then um, if you had questions about the accessibility documentation prior to the submission of your RFO, there was a resource for that as well. Um, everything else must be directed to me. If you're communicating to DIR about your current contract, you may continue to do business as normal, but it is prohibited from asking your current contract manager any status or any information related to this RFO that may disqualify you from the entire process. Next slide. Thank you for attending today. We um, hope you all are able to get your responses submitted in time. And good luck. Please be sure you get your questions in so we can address those formally. And that concludes our conference for today.